Uh, welcome everybody um, to this event. I'm, my name is Jonathan Watts. I'm Global Environment Editor of The Guardian and I'm delighted to be moderating this event which should, ask, should last for about an hour or an hour and a half, something like that, um, depending on the presentations uh, we have by two renowned photographers who have turned their lenses on the subjects of melting ice and sea level rise. Now, this is a photographic challenge uh, par excellence. There are few more important issues in the world, but how to capture a subject that literally changes at a glacial pace and often at a scale beyond any viewfinder how to make that subject fresh when we've been hearing about it for decades, how to show that the ice is now melting twice as fast as it was 10 years ago, which means there is much more urgency, but how to show that, how to engage audiences who generally live hundreds or even thousands of miles away from the nearest glacier. Scientists can do this with figures, megatons of ice mass lost, degrees of temperature change, millimeters of sea level rise. But there's so much more to it than that. How is the, the real challenge is how to show the human impact, how to make it hit home on an emotional level. The great early 19, well, late 19th century environmentalist, John Muir, believed that glaciers were a fountain of culture. The great poets, philosophers, prophets, able men whose thoughts and deeds have moved the world have come down from the mountains, he wrote. He might also have said, have gone to the poles or the most remote areas of, of, the, of, of the world. The challenge is how to catch the eye and engage the mind. So we'll be hearing how to do that from two photographers who I will now introduce, uh, albeit with something of a <laughs> of a uh, an, an announcement about a, a change. This this event uh, is semi live now. I I am live. Um, the next speaker will be live, uh, but one of our main speakers, Simon Norfolk, uh, he found out at the last minute that he had to go to a photo shoot in Afghanistan and he is on the plane as we speak, but he did make time to pre-record a presentation about his uh, project Shroud, about glaciers in the Swiss Alps, which we will see later along with a few questions that I was able to ask him this morning. So we will hear about that a little later. But first though, uh, let's turn to our guest who is with us at the moment, Kadir van Lohausen, uh, who is a photojournalist, lecturer uh, and photography uh, teacher who's based in Amsterdam. He has been a professional freelance journalist since 1988 and he cut his teeth covering conflict zones such as Angola, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, Liberia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, this was often hard hitting news on, I, I imagine, tight deadlines. More recently, however, he has turned to longer form projects such as the Seven Rivers of the World, the diamond industry, migration in the Americas, and two really big projects with a climate connection, one on the Arctic uh, and one on rising sea levels, obviously connected. So, uh, Kadir, welcome. Great to have you with us. Uh, I look forward to uh, discussing some of these topics with you shortly, but uh, perhaps you could kick off with a short presentation of your uh, immense work. Well, thanks for having, uh, having me. Uh, hello to everyone. A short presentation for an immense work. That's uh, kind of a paradox, right? Um, but thank you for the introduction, John. And uh, yeah, le let me uh, shortly introduce, because uh, as John said, uh, I, I never felt a news photographer, but I, I have covered which I felt should have been news or should have uh, been on the front pages. So always a freelancer, never a staff photographer or contract photographer. 
So the big advantage was obviously that it gave me a lot of freedom. I basically could decide where I want to go to and what I felt was important. And on the downside, it obviously gives you insecurity because uh, if no one assigns you and you have to put your own uh, dimes in your saving account uh, to do a story, it's a bit of a lottery sometimes and a risk if, if it comes out and uh, if it uh, will make any profits. So um, I'm speaking to you from Amsterdam, uh, the beautiful city, as you all know, the capital of the Netherlands, and I'm speaking to you from uh, uh, below sea level. And uh, the Dutch are pretty much aware that we live below sea level and uh, we are probably the best protected delta in the world. Uh, experts on coastal management and, uh, and, and how, to, how to deal with the water. Um, but slowly during my work, I, I came across that, uh, that the climate crisis uh, was becoming very serious and, uh, and that we were not really addressing it not the media, not uh, politicians, uh, it doesn't seem to, to really land and, and, and it often felt like, sometimes it felt like I was like screaming from a desert. Um, I, I will show you two parts, uh, one, one is, uh, as John mentioned, it's on the Arctic. Um, I've been in the Arctic before, so if you, if you want to see what the climate crisis does and how quickly it goes, that's the place to be. And uh, the project I'm going to show you, it's, it's quite brief, but it's actually a collaboration with my good friend and colleague, uh, Yuri Kosirev. Uh, I'm only going to show you my work now because of uh, time constraints, but it's a, it's a project we are still working on. It's a project uh, where Yuri is covering, uh, let me start sharing my screen, um, where Yuri is working in the Russian Arctic, he's Russian, and I'm working in the, in the Western Arctic. Uh, being Dutch and kind of assuming that I would have better access in that part of the Arctic and uh, Yuri would have better access in that part of the Arctic, which probably is uh, pretty true. Um, so, as I said, we're still working on it and, uh, and it automatically goes into, into the subject which is very much related to it, uh, which is the consequences of the rising sea level. And I will tell you a little bit more about this uh, when, when we get there. Um, although it's important to mention that uh, um, uh, the pole, the North Pole itself is, uh, the melting of the North Pole is not affecting uh, the sea level rise because it's, it's sea ice, it's already in the sea. So if it melts, it doesn't uh, increase the volume. Uh, but obviously places like uh, Greenland, uh, uh, which is land ice, that is a very big contribution to, uh, uh, to the sea level rise. If Greenland would melt, uh, the sea level would rise by seven meters worldwide. By the way, if Antarctica would melt, it would rise by 86 meters. It's not going to happen in our lifetime, but uh, Many of us live in coastal regions and uh, we can just imagine what, uh, what the effects would be and could be. Um, so basically for, for this project, Yuri and I looked at, at the different components. It's, it's, it's all related to the climate crisis, but it's, uh, we're looking at the militarization of the, of the Arctic. We, lo we are looking at the uh, scientists who are working there. We are looking at the impact of tourism we are looking at uh, the opening up of the new Arctic routes for, for shipping. Um, so, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's ongoing work. Uh, for me, uh, I kind of have been stalled in the Netherlands because uh, I couldn't go anywhere due to COVID. Uh, but Yuri uh, couldn't leave Russia, but at least he works in a time zone. So he's been working in, uh, in the Arctic uh, uh, last year and also this year. I mean, what I forgot to mention is that, that, that we have been looking very 
very often into the different indigenous communities, both in the Russian Arctic as in the Western Arctic, and, and see what the climate crisis uh, means for them and what, what impact it has uh, for their lives. Very difficult region to access, uh, uh, not only difficult, but also very expensive. Uh, travel to the Arctic, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's very time costly and it's very, uh, financially, it's very costly. Um, so luckily we, would, we were able to do this actually initially because uh, uh, we won the Prix Carmignac, which uh, as some of you might know is, uh, is a big photography prize uh, in France and, and they have a theme every year, uh, which you have to apply to and uh, that year it was the Arctic. So Yuri and I, we, we knew pretty much that we had to apply for it and, uh, and we did and we got it. And otherwise uh, it, it probably wouldn't even have been possible. So, well, that brings me um, to, to the next topic, uh, which, uh, which is a project. Uh, well, I actually started to work on it already uh, in 2011, 2010, yeah, 2011, I would say. I was working on another project, uh, which John mentioned, which was about migration in the Americas. Um, I was traveling overland from the very, very tip of Chile to the very north of Alaska interviewing people why they were migrating and, uh, and basically visualizing uh, contemporary migration. So it was in Panama uh, where I reached this beautiful island called the San Blas Islands. They are on the Caribbean coast. I was speaking to people there, interviewing them. And then people said to me, uh, we are being evacuated. And I was like a little puzzled. So I said, why are you being evacuated? And they say, they said, well, the sea is coming. Um, still being a little naive, uh, being from someone who lives below sea level. But then people explained to me that, they, uh, that the sea level was rising and that, that the storms were increasing and that their land was flooded more frequently uh, and that they, were, uh, that would, they were leaving to the mainland to higher ground. So that was kind of the first time that I realized that this was not a problem of uh, of uh, tomorrow and for the next generations, but that this was actually a problem of uh, which exists uh, today. So that was kind of uh, the moment where I started to realize that this was actually something we should address and, uh, and, and where I really felt the need that we should look into it. Today, I mean, if, if you speak to people and you say is that the sea level will rise in the future, most people will acknowledge this, but back in 2011, this was not very common. Um, I was lucky actually, because it, initially I started this project uh, myself. Uh, and then uh, I kind of convinced the New York Times to, to collaborate on this. And that gave me the first opportunity to really start started working on this. They, they, they paid for the expenses, uh, which was great. And basically I started to research different locations in the world where there was an urgency already. And, the problem is often, uh, if we talk about the climate crisis, you know, it's, it's how do you, I'm a photographer, so how do you visualize this? How do you visualize something that's maybe still not visual? So I really had to reconsider my method of working. You know, normally as a photographer, you know when the beautiful light is, you know when, what, what a good picture is. Uh, but for this project, I really uh, changed it and, and I, I was basically my manual to work on this was the tide tab table. So we have high tide every day, we have low tide every day, there's spring tide uh, once a month. So I knew that I had to time uh, where I would be uh, according to the tides. And that was, uh, that was a very important decision because, you know, I mean, I, I figured that if you can show uh, already that, that parts, uh, coastal regions are getting flooded 
at, at the normal high tide, you can only imagine what it would mean uh, if, if it would, would rise by one, two or three meters even. And it's not a question if it will rise by one, two or three meters, the question is just when. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I feel like a journalist, I'm a photojournalist, uh, but I also feel that this is, a, this is a message which I really wanted to send out. I mean, I, I see the work a bit as visual proof, uh, because as we all know, there's still a lot of people who are denying uh, that, that the climate crisis is happening, or they're at least denying that it's happening because of human behavior. But uh, uh, I find it quite striking. I mean, you just saw the images of Miami, and uh, Miami is, was like the most crazy example maybe in the whole story, because Miami can't be protected because it's built on limestone. So all experts have said that you, whatever seawall you, you built around Miami, if it's on limestone, the water will just sip under and the city will be flooded anyway. Meaning that Miami, Miami Beach at least, will have to be evacuated probably in 30 years from now, uh, which is a very strange thought. It's a very strange thought, especially uh, because it's a city built on real estate is booming still. They are building lots of uh, uh, apartment blocks still. So uh, it sometimes made me wonder, how is it possible that, that we have all this knowledge and that we know that this is happening and that this will happen, but we're actually not really acting. Um, and as I said, I mean, uh, in the early days when I, when I started working on this project, it was a pretty hard sell to the media, you know, I mean, uh, it was not considered to be really relevant. Uh, so, to be honest, it was quite brave of the, of the New York Times that they, uh, that they stepped in and that they partly financed uh, the project. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Jakarta, well, let, let me explain a little bit because, you know, I mean, the question is always when you, when do you conclude a project like that? You know, I mean, I could work on this for, uh, for the rest of my life probably, but I felt at some point that, that I was repeating myself, that I felt like how many islands can I show that, that, that are getting flooded? And I kind of stopped the project in, in 2015. And it was actually that the Dutch television approached me and asked me if I could do a television series uh, on the same topic that, that it kind of revived the whole project. So that allowed me to go back to locations, I've, uh, places where I've been before, and it allowed me uh, to, to visit new places. And I think in that sense, you know, also because of the, you know, it was different in 2011 than it was in 2018. So I, you know, I mean, initially I didn't include even the Netherlands because I considered this to be where I'm sitting to be, as I said, a very well protected uh, country. But uh, it was only like two years ago, three years ago, that the very alarming report came out about the Netherlands, that, uh, that the Netherlands could, can maybe deal with one meters of sea level rise. But if, if, we, if it becomes two meters or even three meters, uh, that uh, probably part of the Netherlands need to be relocated meaning that cities like Rotterdam, The Hague, and uh, Amsterdam uh, will cease to exist, which is a, a very strange and tough thought. I mean, uh, uh, that, that, that this country where I am now, that, that, that we might have to relocate, that we might have to knock on the door of the Germans. Um, so what I'm trying to say is not, I'm, I don't want to make a doom and gloom uh, show out of this, but I, I, I do think it's a very important role of journalism to signal the issues uh, where politicians are probably not acting. And that unfortunately has been the case uh, for many years. And, uh, and we know very well, and I think uh, many people who are either in science or are engineers know that uh, we, we have run out of time as well. And that uh, if, if we have to make choices, if we want to, be, to protect parts of the world and that people can remain living there. Um, I will close off with Kiribati, uh, this beautiful nation in, uh, of atolls 
in uh, in the Pacific between Hawaii and uh, and Fiji, and that was kind of you know that was not so difficult to visualize what's going on. Um, you know, people live with the water uh, every day. They're losing their 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 soil where they can grow crops because it gets saline. They don't have drinking water anymore. And, uh, and they know that they have to relocate in the end. But the question is, this is a nation. So what, do, what happens to a nation if, they lose, uh, if people lose their own country and don't know where to go? What happens to their culture? What happens to their language? And uh, this is something which is actually not addressed at all internationally. And uh, yeah, I'm not... Uh, an activist, but I'm a very active journalist, and I, I think it's important to to share those stories. Back to you, John. Thank you very much, Kadir, uh, for these really uh, powerful images and a strong message. You're not an activist, but you're a very active journalist. I, I like that distinction uh, a lot. Um, I. I, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions before we uh, look at Simon's presentation, but I would urge um, those of you in the audience, there will be a little time for questions uh, to Kadir or I later. Uh, so I th if you look at the bottom, uh, there is a space for you to uh, submit your questions if you have any, uh, and we'll take a look at those um, at the end. Um, so, but first of all, a couple of very simple questions I suppose could be the first one is um, as you as you were saying it's it's often difficult to to get people interested in something that is kind of in the background or remote um, and I think as a journalist many of us who have come to be called environmental journalists we didn't really start that way when I when I set out in journalism I was writing more about finance and football than I was about climate change. That was admittedly 25 years ago. And as you were saying, you started out uh, much more um, in, in conflict regions. And I, my question to you is, is what was it that made you uh, kind of shift towards uh, these kind of environmental issues? And I mean, in, in my case, it, it was not so much a it was it was a steady transition and i think a a sense that i wanted more to look at the cause of conflict the really deep rooted uh origins of of why people were being forced to move why migration was uh accelerating uh why there was more tension um and without realizing it i kept coming to the, the, <laughs> the conclusion that these environmental factors it's because People don't have clean drinking water or, uh, yes, rising sea levels or many of the issues uh, you've raised there. But for you, what, what, was, what was the moment when you started to think, oh, I'm, I'm actually quite passionate about this and I need to devote more of my time to this? Um, well, it, it, it's, it's a bit similar, you know. I started to make, uh, make the connections that, 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 that uh, many of the reasons for conflicts are related to the to the climate it, it is that uh, people uh, lose their their fertile soil that they lose their drinking water that they lose their land so i started to make these connections uh, but i still didn't know how to kind of deal with this visually so maybe the, the what maybe the momentum was katrina uh, and I remember very clearly that Katrina happened in August, late August 25, to, to 2005. And many of us uh, were at, uh, some of you might know it, this uh, great photo festival in Perpignan, Visa Pour Image. All, all the photographers are there. It's a, it's a festival of photojournalism. And we were all there, and I remember that there was this news coming out that uh, there was this huge hurricane approaching Louisiana or the uh, the south coast of uh, of the U.S. So the hurricane hit, and I remember that, and very many of my colleagues they were anxious. We got to go, and I thought, well, I'm not going because I'm not covering natural disasters. So I remember the the day, the morning after it happened, 
that the front page of the New York Times said uh, New Orleans escaped major disaster. Two hours later, the city was flooded. And then I thought this is actually not uh, a natural disaster. This is a man-made man disaster. And that was kind of where it flipped for me that I started to understand that this was, that this was all related. So I went there, stayed there for three weeks, and then I followed the whole aftermath for, for five years. So I, I guess that was kind of maybe where, I st where it started and that I understood that, uh, that, that the climate crisis, uh, what we have to deal with, that we have to take this very serious. And that, and that we have to put it in a perspective as journalists, that we carry a huge responsibility to report about this in a proper way. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think once you see it and once you start to look, that's almost all you can see sometimes. You, it, it sort of pervades and, and everything and becomes a way of looking rather than a distinct subject in its own right. At least that's what I've found. Um, one more question before we, we go over to uh, Simon's work. This is about technique. And I know some of the people who are signed up for this event are photographers themselves and the climate is obviously becoming uh, a more important issue and will become far more so in the future. I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, you, you, I, I can think of four, four things that you mentioned in your original presentation about how your technique uh, uh, has been used to sort of draw out the impacts of climate change. Uh, two of those things are uh, like basic journalism, I suppose. One is focus on the human impact. Um, the, the other is to really look at, uh, at things from a different time scale. So it's not a day to day thing. These long projects lend themselves, I think, much more to uh, looking at climate change. The third one is returning um, and going to a place one year and then going back, as you were saying, uh, five or six years later. Uh, and, and a fourth one, which was implied, although you didn't say it directly, was, you know, you need to be working with science, uh, maybe not directly, but you, you have to get the science right or nothing else works. And I was I'd like to know a little bit more about how your technique has changed to try and capture these long term changes, the, the different time scale of news involved. Um, and in particular, maybe this one's a little hard to answer, but there's there's natural change, there's natural seasonal change. Um, and that that, of course, is, is used by the denialist to say, oh, well, it always happens. And then on top of that, there's like the human footprint, the human fingerprint, if you like, of, of what, what has been the effect of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how in an image to distinguish between the two. Because I know from what I do, I rely on science and numbers to do that. Uh, but much harder, I think, uh, in, in your case, although the Kiribati images by themselves are really very striking but yes if you could talk a little on on technique and how technique has changed there's a lot of questions john <laughs> <laughs> you can see why i don't work for tv um well but what i what i can say is uh, that 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 research has been crucial on this so the amount of time I spent on the, the amount of time I uh, spent on photography was a fraction of the of the time I actually spent on on the whole project and on the research because I was very quickly very aware that there were a lot of people who were skeptical uh, about this whole story and uh, and and were denying that this was happening and in that sense it was a very good uh, the New York Times was a was a, a good place to be because uh, you know I mean they they were even quite skeptical sometimes so um, I had to present at least two 
verifiable sources before I could claim anything. So whether I was writing a, a caption or a, 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 a short text to, to, a, to a region, that, so that made me, you know, and that's obviously not a Wikipedia uh, uh, cut and paste. So, you know, and so for that, I, I used many sources like scientists, like other journalists, like, uh, um, so that, that was very important. Um, because of the time for my presentation, I, I wasn't able to show uh, other components because, uh, yes, I'm a photographer, but I used a lot of video as well. Uh, I used uh, uh, drone, uh, I, I'm, I'm writing as well. Um, so that's, uh, those components are, are really important and, and, and made it much probably stronger and more convincing. Thank you. Um, great. So let's go over to uh, we, we, we're going to have a the pre recorded section now with Simon. It's uh, there's his presentation for about five or 10 minutes, then uh, some uh, 15, 20 minutes of questions with me. Um, so, uh, Kadir, you and I can um, sit back and watch for a little while. I hope everyone in the audience enjoys this, some brilliant, fascinating comments by Simon and then uh, at the end, I'd like to take uh, your questions. So please think of any questions you have. Uh, so uh, Claire or Michael, uh, who are in the background there, I hope, please, could you run that presentation uh, by Simon? Simon, uh, great to see you this morning. And it's very good of you to do uh, a pre-record because uh, you were planning to join us live and now you have to go to Afghanistan at short notice. Uh, so we're doing this last minute on the morning of the event. Uh, there might be some disturbances from my dog. Uh, fingers crossed that won't happen. Um, but let's get straight into it. Um, I believe you've got a presentation that you're going to show us to begin with. Um, and then we can have a, a discussion about some of the pictures. So if you want to just kick off, um, okay. that would be great. All right, so I need to uh, share screen, share screen and. OK, how's that? Got that? Are you, are you looking at the logo? Proud, Norfolk and Timon for okay, Project right. Pressure. Okay, good. So I'll talk about this, uh, the project that I made with Klaus Thumann um, uh, on the uh, Rhone Glacier in Switzerland, uh, which we call Shroud. And uh, for, uh, for Kadir's um, benefit, I thought I'd begin by talking about uh, one of my favourite little sub, 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 sub genres of paintings. There's landscape painting, there's Dutch landscape painting, Dutch landscape painting of the Golden Age, Dutch landscape painting of the Golden Age featuring whales, beached whales, which was a kind of little sub genre. Uh, and I, I remember the first time I ever went to a glacier, the first time I ever touched a glacier, the first time I ever placed my hand against it, I felt like it was some kind of uh, the, the sort of final beats of an expiring animal under my hand. It was the most extraordinary feeling, this huge mass of ice that was just wasting away. And these paintings, I think, are very interesting. The same sort of, you must feel the same if you're in the presence of a, of a darted elephant or a, a beach whale. These paintings are very interesting from, this, from, the, from the Dutch. They're, there's a, a great sense of sort of spectacle. They only appeared for a very short period, about 80 years in Dutch painting, uh, of these kind of beach whales. And you can see half the town, all the lords and ladies have turned out to see these things. This is a huge inspiration for me, these pictures. Because a lot of these pictures contain great kind of portents of disaster. These beached animals, you know, an entire shoal of whales turns up on a beach in, in, uh, in, on, on the coast of the Netherlands, and it seemed like God was angry. It seemed like these were portents of huge disaster. This is, this is a really beautiful drawing of uh, uh, a beach whale. I'm not going to uh, massacre the name of this place because Kadir will laugh at me for my ship pronunciation, but um, you can see all the lords and ladies have turned out. It's an object of curiosity. Uh, um, so, you know, people are all over the animal. It looks like a fair is taking place on the beach. But at the very top of this picture, you can see that, and this was a very turbulent time in Dutch politics, uh, in the centre of the picture here, you have death on a, on a cloud. He's firing arrows at the maid of Amsterdam on the left hand side who is falling. That's the symbol of Amsterdam. There's a, there's a symbol of earthquakes. At the top of the picture in the centre is the eclipse moon. The, the, the arrival uh, on the very top left hand corner is Father Time. Uh, his, the sands are running out in his, uh, uh, in his egg timer. 
Um, the arrival of these these beach whales was must have been a sign that something was unbalanced in the world, that nature was was kind of puking up onto the beach, uh, its fury and its uh, its kind of waste products, uh, and that humans were bound to suffer. And it's interesting that this these paintings were produced in a very short, very turbulent time of uh, of war in the in the Netherlands and, and turbulence, and particularly religious turbulence. Um, and the, the, uh, I took a lot of these ideas to the, uh, to the, to the Ron Glacier when I went there. I first went there on a cycling holiday. Um, and it's, I'm not the first person to get there. The reason why this glacier is uh, so popular is because it is right by the, so, by, by the main road, one of the main roads that connects the sort of southern half of Switzerland. And it goes right by the side and up and over the Furka Pass. Uh, and a hundred years ago, the glacier tumbled right the way down the hill. It was this amazing sea of ice. Uh, and it was because there was so much traffic on the road um, from the post that became traffic on the road from tourists and then because there were tourists there was a hotel family built a famous hotel there uh, and, a, and then eventually a gift shop uh, and it's uh, it's there in southern Switzerland so it became a very famous stopping point everybody would go past and stop and eventually the Zeeler family who still owned the gift shop but they've been their third generation fourth generation now I think uh, they decided it was worth trying to persuade tourists to stop spend a bit of money by every year digging a, a grotto into the ice, burrowing into the ice and creating a, a sort of touristic experience. You pay a few francs, you go inside, you sit underneath the blue ice and you see the light coming through in this kind of sepulchral chamber. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was a, a living for the, for, the, uh, for the family that lived there. Um, obviously every year the, the, the glacier slides down the mountain. Uh, so your grotto slides down the mountain and disappears and melts. And so it has to be redug every year. Uh, but you can see where the road goes up uh, in the center of the picture. You can see where the hotel is and that's exactly where the gift shop is. And it was just a short walk to the glacier and inside the, the glacier experience for which they were making a, a living. Um, and uh, this was the kind of thing. And it was a big thing in, in Swiss tourism because it was easy it was right by the road you didn't have to climb anywhere you could do it in your day shoes you could do it with a pack of sandwiches uh, and it was a, a very much a kind of to-do thing in southern switzerland uh, obviously some people chose a slightly more <laughs> terrifying mode of transport i cycled up this uh, up this road a couple of times uh, but i wouldn't go on that damn thing uh, and i'm not the first person to go on this hill uh, the left hand side is a picture of me next to my Oh no, hell no, no, that's not me, that's Sean Connery. We're, we're often confused, me and Sean. Uh, that's Sean Connery by his DB5, and there's an entire section of Goldfinger uh, is shot uh, as, he, as he drives up and over the pass. He's following Erno Goldfinger in his Rolls Royce, uh, and he gets um, shot at by Pussy Galore. Uh, and you see uh, the DB5 and James Bond uh, drive past the Furka the Furka the Furka Glacier, um, the, the Ron Glacier and the hotel. It was so famous, it was even included in 1964 in, in Goldfinger. So the, the, um, one of the things that I wanted to do with this project is uh, I did a project with Project, project Pressure and Klaus five years ago, which was about, hey, gla glaciers are disappearing. And so I made a, a machine that paints fire lines at night and on very long exposures. And what I tried to show was this is where the glacier was in 1963. This is where the glacier was in 2001. This is where the glacier is now. And you can see how much ice is disappearing. And, and uh, five, six years ago, that was a kind of interesting thing to say. Nowadays, everyone's agreed glaciers are disappearing. We don't really need to make that statement anymore. It was a bit more relevant a few years ago. Now, I think the problem is, what on earth are we going to do about this disappearance? Because here is somebody who is trying to stop the disappearance. Because the glacier is disappearing past the back of the gift shop, disappearing around the corner, going higher and higher up the mountain, the gift shop have found it only in their financial interest. It just affects their bottom line. It's worth them spending the money of putting insulating blankets on the glacier every year. They add more, more and more blanket in an attempt to stop a little bit of the glacier melting away so that they've got enough to burrow a, a grotto into it. And, it's, and it costs, I think it was 90,000 Swiss francs they were spending. You need a helicopter to get the, the rolls of fabric up there. Uh, so it's very expensive, but it's worth it just for them. And it's kind of nuts, right? It's sort of impossible. Uh, you, you know, these are these things called geotextiles, these things on the right. They put them under airfields and garbage dumps and, and, and uh, um, particularly for waste dumps and stuff. Um, but you can see that they can only, the picture on the left hand side is one of mine, but that you can see they can only cover an entire, an, a small portion of the glacier, the rest of it is disappearing, and we cannot do this with the world's glaciers. You cannot put a blanket on top of a Greenland ice cap. 
this costs a fortune. Imagine what it would cost to do the Greenland ice cap or Antarctica or most of the, uh, the Himalayas. Uh, it's insane. It's insane. It's completely bonkers. It's kind of King Canute like uh, and uh, it uh, cannot be uh, a policy, but it does indicate towards the scale of the trillions that will be involved uh, if we don't do something about climate change and, and the multiple trillions if we wait until 2050 to do anything about climate change. It's a kind of indicator of those things. And the second thing I just say before we start is that I'm very interested in, in this kind of uh, idea of you know, as an artist, I mentioned this idea of kind of liquidity, of, of, of form being made to look like human soft flesh and tissue. When I first saw the glacier, it looked to me like it was being wrapped in preparation for its own funeral. That's why we called it Shroud. It looked like it was being wrapped for its own death ceremony. Uh, and the, the fabric that was on the thing has all been battered by the, by the weather. Every year they have to put new stuff on further, higher, higher, they put new stuff on and it's moved down by the moving glacier. And the old stuff is just a bunch of old rags that hangs there. And my first thought when I saw it was it looks like Carrara marble. It has all that soft, delicate drapery of Carrara marble. And Carrara marble is an extraordinary material. It's like almost, almost, almost the most impossible material to carve with. But because it is so impossible, the greatest talents that have ever carved Carrara marble can make it look like the softness of linen or the softness of flesh. And that's a really interesting thing because I'm very interested in, in, in the Paleolithic is my big thing nowadays and the Neolithic. But for the first 45,000 years of artistic production, this is what people did with sculpture. They made forms look like this, absolutely rigid. These are pictures of gods and they are not human-like, they are rigid and fierce and upright, and they are not to be sympathized with, they are to be terrorized by. Thus spake the Lord, right? You don't negotiate with these gods, and that's why the statuary that was produced for them is this rigid, upright, full-on stare. These are not gods of benevolence, these are gods that tell you what to do, and you do it or they will destroy you. And that was the way the sculptural form. And one of the amazing things I think is the, is the Greek Baroque, Look at the difference between these two sculptures. No one really knows why. About 250 BC, on a few of the islands in the Aegean, sculptors suddenly started to turn rock into something liquid, something soft, something that could present the, the softness of the human form, of muscle under skin, of blood pulsing through the veins, of, of the softness of cloth, uh, and the twisting and torsion of a body exerting itself. On the, on, the, on the left hand side, or even the wound in that man's, uh, this is the dying Gaul that's in the Capitoline Museum in, in Moscow, in uh, Rome. Uh, and you can see the blood leaching from this wound in this man's side as his lifeblood drips away from him. Uh, and the pathos and the tragedy of seeing that man, that great warrior, uh, as, he, as he breathes his last few breaths. Uh, and Stone could do this for the first time. And, and, the, and the Greek Baroque was an incredible leap forward. And suddenly this rigidity was dumped. And you, you, had, you had stone, the hardest stone, the most impossible stone to carve. And it looked like something liquid and beautiful and flowing and full of energy and power and blood and life and emotion. And it's, it, it's, you need to point out that it took a thousand years for painting to catch on. For another thousand years after sculptors were making stuff like this, painters were still doing the rigid thing. And paintings for a thousand years looked like this. 1340, uh, Lorenzetti, a fantastic painter, but he's still producing this painting, which is absolutely upright and rigid. And, and it takes, uh, it takes the, the Renaissance in Italy to really challenge that and to, and, and to create artists who are capable of, of really portraying human emotion and softness and gentility and fragility uh, and, and getting away from this rigid thing. This is Michelangelo's Pietà. It's probably the finest piece of marble in the world. And it's, it, you know, look at the softness and the, and the, and the, and the flowing nature of the, of the dress of the Madonna. And look at the, the lifelessness that is in the body of the dead Christ, the way the flesh hangs even on his bones. Look at the triceps on his, on his forearm. And the amazing, one of the, one of the most striking parts of this picture for me as someone who photographs glaciers is in the bottom left-hand side of this picture, you can see the thing that the, the Madonna is sitting and standing on. She's standing on Golgotha rock. She's standing on the rock of, the, of Calvary. Uh, and Michelangelo has taken the most expensive stone in the world and carved it like a genius to make it look like the crappiest piece of rock on a, on a waste site just outside the city of Jerusalem where Christ himself was crucified. 
Look at this picture by Mantegna. This is what I'm trying to illustrate about this idea of changing and producing something more liquid. Look at this folds of this drapery, and it's like he's gone to town, you know, demonstrating his genius of I can show you every one of these single folds and paint all of this stuff. But I would say what this painting is about is about the thing that is in the center of this painting. It's about his manhood, right? Quite literally, his manhood is the central thing in this painting, but also his status as a man. This is not a painting of a god. This is not a painting of a dead son of God. This is a painting of a man. And he looks like a man. And that's not a painting of the Virgin Mary nor of her stiffness. That's the picture of a, that's a, that's a, a grieving mother bawling her eyes out and nothing more than that. And that was an amazing revelation. And one of the things that really amazed me about the glacier was its ability to, um, uh, to be transformed from something like something as hard as ice over time, over pressure, over thousands of years, can cut through a mountain like it is made out of butter. It's like it's plastic. Water becomes ice and becomes the hardest thing on earth. The softest thing on earth, water becomes the hardest thing on earth, like diamond that can grind through an entire mountain given enough time and pressure. And then the final thing I'll say is the lights that we chose for the project. My wife is a surgeon, uh, and when I saw the blankets, I knew that I needed some special lighting to illustrate all of that three-dimensional texture of the blankets lying like this shroud on the, uh, hanging off the ice, all tattered and blown apart by the winters. And I wanted, I say that I wanted the light on the glacier to look like the light over an anatomy table. I wanted it to look like the light from a mortuary. Uh, and the very first operating theatres had this kind of light. You know, these are the, these are the um, this top-down light, this uh, sepulchral light from above. I wanted to kind of imitate this, just as these people are uh, doing surgery or taking apart a corpse for the entertainment of medical students, the entertainment of the general public once upon a time. Um, that that light, I wanted to kind of replicate that light. So the way that we came up with that is a project that I've been, I think I've been working for ages. I bought a balloon, I bought a huge balloon. It's, it's, filled, it's filled with helium. <laughs> it's got about 200 quid's worth of helium in it. Uh, it's about the size of a car. It just about goes in the back of a transit van. It's not actually a balloon, it's actually a kite. And I bought it from some kind of spooky military manufacturer down in Wiltshire that supplies them to the SAS for lifting antennas for the jungle warfare. Um, but um, <clears throat> it can carry a kilo. And because it's a kite, it's very, very stable. Once the wind gets on it, it sits exactly in place. If it was just a ball, like a balloon, it would just wobble about like crazy. It would just be a nightmare. But uh, it sits very steady and it can carry a kilo, which is exactly the weight of this big flash gun I've got. So when we did the pictures, the camera is on the tripod, is on, is on the glacier, and the light is up in the sky. It's just above the frame. Uh, and somewhere in the picture, Klaus is hiding behind a, a ridge. He's, he's holding the cables. Uh, he's holding this very fine wire that holds the balloon. Uh, and the two of us, uh, I was doing the, the pictures and Klaus, uh, the balloon, you have to kind of play the balloon. It's, it's quite an art form. You have to pull it and lift it and then give it string and let it go and then bring it in and then lift it again. And then the wind will take it. And then there's a moment when it's in exactly the right place. And then it, that's when you take the picture. And I wanted that top light. And I, I, would, I would describe it as it's like owning your own personal moon. It's like having your own directable moonlight. It's fantastic. Uh, and you can place this top light exactly what you want in the landscape. You can send a cone of light down to just emphasize one part of the landscape. So I'm afraid I don't have time to kind of show you all the pictures. You'll have to look at them on the website, but Belfast have got the website. There's a fantastic print for, for them to, uh, uh, for you to look at, a huge print. Uh, but uh, the light was, um, that the that was the idea behind the light, the idea to create this idea that it looked like you were looking at a mortuary table of an object that was being prepared for its own funeral, an object that had the kind of hardness of diamond. Ice is like harder than diamond. It can grind an entire mountain, but in certain forms, it has the kind of liquidity of what kind of someone like Michelangelo can do with Carrera marble. Uh, that's a very brief introduction. How's that? Thank you, Simon. That was totally amazing. Uh, 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 bounding through the centuries and through different forms of art. I, I'd never seen the, the pictures of the beach whales. Uh, very impressive. <laughs> and combining that with Michelangelo and Pussy Galore, I don't think any presentation has ever crossed uh, those particular barrier uh, territories before. Um, but obviously, the, the thing that really stands out that the the subject we are discussing today is 
this idea of covering a glacier, melting glacier in thermal blankets as if it's as kind of a, a sick, a sick grandparent that you can kind of just tuck in and make them feel a little bit better as they sort of approach their death. Um, it, it's, it's very powerful and horrifying. And uh, I, it, it makes me feel, I mean, it, it, of course it shows the folly of human hubris. Uh, it also makes me feel that maybe something we're losing when is, is the loss of the sublime. Uh, that 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 idea that there was something rigid and hard and it will uh, impose itself upon us, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, and yet, again, you made it. You, you it, it now seems very fragile, um, at least in its old form. Of course, we know it's moving into a new form that might not be so fragile. But maybe if you could talk a little bit about this uh, sense of the is the anti sublime in a way that seems to be captured uh by your well, I pictures think, i think that's a really interesting idea i mean in a funny way i mean when you're on the, the wrong glacier you're only about 40 miles away from the place where the sublime was virtually invented which is the mer de glace and chamonix and all of those grand romantic tourists that were traveling over switzerland to go on the grand tour to rome you have to go over if you're english you have to go through switzerland to get to the ruins of rome uh, and they were the ones that kind of invented the sublime when they saw you know no englishman had ever seen an avalanche you know you don't get them on the south downs you know no englishman had ever seen a thunderstorm that could you know just destroy an entire mountain village and sweep it away or you know torrents uh, and these things terrorize those great romantics and so they invented this this notion of sublime you know the, the beautiful thing that is also terrifying they sort of invented it kind of in switzerland on the way to rome um uh, and i've always kind of worshipped uh, you know those, those those really are my heroes you know percy shelley he's my homeboy so um but i, I think the, the sort of, uh, you know, we were talking a couple of days ago about the sort of connection between this work and the work I'm doing in Afghanistan and the conflict work I was doing 20 years ago was I always thought that, you know, it always tremendously animated me that those people, they were the first artists that really got excited about the world, right? You know, the classicists weren't, weren't they weren't hells are popping. They weren't, their minds weren't exploding when they looked at the world. They were just saying, oh, look, classical Greece and let's recreate it. But the romantics were the ones that were, they were tumultuous and they were tousled head and the wind blew in their face and their shirts were open and they were sexy and they were, you know, uh, you know, and they were just wonderful characters. And, and the, the emotions that they felt when they saw those landscapes, I feel like I can't feel those now. I don't, feel the same way when I look at an avalanche because I know a bit about how avalanches are formed and friction and the rest of it. You don't feel the same about a thunderstorm because I, you know, I know a bit about where a thunderstorm comes. And, and, and the, the, the thing that I was looking for when I went to Afghanistan is where do you find the sublime in the modern world? We have so much science and learning that you and I can't get terrorized about a thunderstorm or you know, tremulous about an avalanche. Um, but in Afghanistan, when you saw the effects of modern American weaponry, it seemed to me in a godless world, that was about the one place where you could still feel. I mean, this, the way that, you know, the roofs were rift off buildings, it was beautiful. It was an extraordinary landscape torn apart by modern weaponry. It, it was beautiful. And yet it was horrible and awful and bloody as well. And it seemed to me like that was the only place left where you could still find that sublime. And, and, and then I started a kind of you know, sort of 20 year search really for where do you still find the sublime in this world? Where can you still feel genuinely, uh, you know, uh, ventilated this idea of terror? And, uh, and I found it in modern battlefields torn apart by the, you know, the very best weaponry. I found it by looking into the kind of guts of supercomputers was the only other place I really found it. When I looked inside the guts of the supercomputer that's designing America's nuclear weapons, biggest supercomputer in the world at the time, Blue Gene L in Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in, in California. Uh, and, I, and I think the only other place you can find it is when you, you look at a glacier and you realize the, the power of human destruction, that, that my lifestyle and our lifestyles and the way we've gone about petrochemicals uh, has created this catastrophic loss of these things and our grandchildren will not have the joy of looking at these things. And, and you know, a, a, a Kenyan will not have the rainwater watering his fields of these things. Uh, uh, and uh, and it's a huge problem and, uh, and, uh, and it's a huge tragedy and I think it's one of the few places where you can genuinely feel a, a real genuine sadness and turmoil and tragedy and, and not not a phony thing 
uh, and that and that's really what I've been kind of looking for for 20 years really trying to re trying to rekindle that sense of awe and wonder in the world in a genuine kind of way because so much of our science and understanding has kind of swept it away you know made it too comprehensible uh, totally and uh, I, I think I've, I've our paths have not crossed before but my 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 objectives are very similar I also love the romantic poets and have traveled widely looking for that sublime I, I think I, I certainly have found it um in 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 mountains um in 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 the north and south pole but i do feel that there there, were, there is a word that has taken precedence over the sublime which is solastalgia you know this idea this this it's it's a relatively new word but solastalgia is when you're looking at something you feel a sense of loss immediately because you know it's not going to be like that very soon as a result of uh, what humanity is doing to the world. So you're, you're looking at a, a glacier and it still looks magnificent, at least if in, in the very high mountains or in the North or South Pole. Uh, but you know it's diminishing. You're seeing something decline. And that idea that Mother Nature is actually more like Grandmother Nature now. And everything we're talking about, of course, is this is the the Anthropocene this is this we are in control and everything you've just described the places where you feel awe now is not so much awe at nature which is diminishing but awe at humanity which is becoming more powerful uh, and more destructively powerful and it, it does make me think as well that whether the, the sort of the, the classicists that you talked about who were you know not didn't quite have the passion and the oomph uh, perhaps as the romantics, maybe that's because they lived in a more stable environment. They could take things for granted, whereas the romantics, uh, it, that was the start of the Industrial Revolution, when mankind's power was really just coming to the fore. Um, and on one sense, you have the sublime. Uh, but this is when you first have uh, discussion about it's it's when the word environment was coined in the Romantic period. It didn't exist before. It wasn't needed before. Uh, it's part of that. It, it created a duality between man and nature, um, and and maybe it was that 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 sort of filled the Romantics with so much pa passion because they not only could they capture the beauty of nature uh, and the sublime, but there was also that that's around the time the Gothic emerged. Uh, and of course, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and so on, uh, very, very close to those glaciers, I would have thought. And it, when I was looking at some of your earlier work of uh, marking the former borders of the glaciers with, with lines of petrol, there was something very gothic about that when I, when I looked at it. I'm not sure if that was intended, um, but that idea of Gothic is both beauty, beautiful and horrific at the same time, so, somewhat different from the sublime. Um, and yeah, I, I, that mix again of you talking uh, earlier about the, uh, the dissecting table and getting the light right. Um, and and it, it, that's something Gothic there as well. And we are sort of, we created this monster again to really get into the Gothic imagery and, um, that uh, is is now threatening up us again, and and I, I wonder how you how you capture both the beauty of it to kind of pull someone in, and the horror of it to make someone reach a, a sort of an awareness that can lead to action. Well, I just want to just catch one thing about what, about what you're saying was the idea about the. the the, the the places in the world where we can still find the sublime the, the, the you know i think the difference between us and, and percy shelley is that it was a world that was being made in percy shelley's case if you ignore the slavery and the colonialism and the rest of it uh, but it was a world that was being kind of fabricated you know percy shelley's lord, lord byron had uh, well uh, someone like um uh, uh william um uh What's the name of the uh, the guy who built the the tower in Bath and wrote Vartek, uh, the novelist? Uh, you know his 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 investments were from the slave trade, so he was directly involved in these things. But it was a world that they were creating. They were creating a British Empire, a colonial uh, structures. They were building factories. Now it's now it seems the sublime that's around us is all the sublime of destruction. We are in awe of 
how much concrete is laid across you know huge uh, city scale objects there. how 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 vast is an american feed lot outside chicago of um, a million cattle waiting to be slaughtered how vast is the oceans of uh, of plastic in the in the uh, in the oceans um and it seems like all of these things are destructive so what i think what interests me is not just that they're beautiful but that there's a sense of responsibility not just that you see something disappearing but you also acknowledge your role in that when i did the pictures on mount kenya it was it was a fortuitous thing but we had mapping of 1963 and i was very keen to map where the glacier was in 1963 because that was the year i was born so that exactly represents the amount of disappears that glacier in my lifetime and i think the idea of uh, i wouldn't want the romantics and, and solastalgia to be a thing about oh it's disappearing isn't that sad but rather isn't that sad and haven't i had a part in that uh, and therefore hopefully i'm empowered to have a part in preventing it and stopping it and fixing it too yeah it's and, and two parts of that absolutely and, and this is where you are you're using art and you're using beauty yeah uh to kind of as, as we discussed the other day to kind of capture an audience yes and lead them in a way to the science and to the the activism side of things right yes and, and that's where project pressure really came in and that, that really was klaus's department because he's he's the one that's in contact with the scientists he's the one that makes sure that the the points that we're making are scientifically valid that we you know we, we talk to the scientists before we go I, I don't have to do all that kind of research about is this glacier typical is this glacier in the right place uh, is it actually you know so there are a few glaciers in the world are growing bizarrely for very small reasons a tiny percentage um so uh and, and and likewise when i did the first pictures on mount kenya klaus got me the mapping he got me in touch with the people in uh, university of salzburg who have studied the mountains so really um 80 years now that they've done very intense uh that's why we went to that place because we had really good depth of analysis really good mapping and really good quality mapping over a really long period of time which is very unusual um so uh, that was the kind of relationship with project pressure very much as well was that they brought in the sort of scientific side and so that i can stand with confidence to say what i'm saying about this glacier is true you know it's, it's documentary it's journalistically true okay now i can show you something beautiful you know you, you know I, I just need to get that out of the way and now i can titillate you with something beautiful and suck you in and make it wonderful and make you think about carrara marble and pietas and, and all those other things but you've got to get that base stuff done first you know and that was project pressure's foundational work it was really important to me it made my life a lot easier not having to do it myself grand well we have to leave um <laughs> plenty of time for kadir as well so i i Maybe we can sort of segue uh, towards uh, Kadir's work. Uh, if you could comment on what you 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 know have been your impressions of how how he he's managed to sort of capture uh, ice and 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 sea level rise, which in a way you would think that don't lend themselves very obviously to photography because it's not moving at well, it's moving at a glacial pace uh, literally. Um, that, that how 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 you and he are yeah any crossovers between what you're doing uh, either in technique or in objectives uh, so just to sort of take us on to um Kadir's work um, well uh, not technique i think yeah the pictures are kind of wildly different really mine are very kind of uh, performative almost uh, and, and Kadir's are very journalistic uh very documentary um uh, I mean, I admire that enormously in Kadir. That he's, I mean, he's one of the last of the Mohicans, really, and that he's still, and, and the agency that he's with, Nor, you know, they're still fighting the good fight. Everyone else has walked away from it and is, you know, disappeared down dead end alleys. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Kadir has stayed with the idea of that you know, there is a, a, a documentary truth, it needs to be revealed. We need to go and show these things to an audience that doesn't know about this stuff. Uh, and also, you know, he's a great photographer so he makes great pictures that have a, a, a feast for the eyes and that's the thing that draws you in because they're well constructed they're well crafted it's not just that he you know there's a lot of stuff on instagram where people just cover the bases and a lot of scientists do pictures in the places where they are where they you know just shoot snaps of what they do uh, but there's almost nobody that has the kind of breadth of what kadir does with these 
global project. I remember a project he did about diamond production that started in a diamond mine in, in you know, Zaire or Congo or somewhere uh, and ended in, you know, a diamond ring on someone's finger in India or New York or whatever via the diamond bourses in Antwerp and South Africa. And an amazing kind of global thing with a real ambition to it. Uh, and, and these are global processes which are, as you say, you know, unvis unvisible. They're not invisible, but they're unvisible. Uh, and our job as photographers, both Kadir and I, is to take these very gradual processes. How do you talk about a little shift in the global economy involving one commodity? How do you talk about a rise of three millimeters on a sea level? How do you talk about a disappearance of a, a meter and a half of glacier in a year? You can't really photograph those with traditional methods. You've got to fall back upon your intelligence and imagination to find new ways to to, re, to 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 bring these things before an audience that engages them and challenges them the problem we have is not the science there's plenty of science there's plenty of people like you writing about it in our popular newspapers there's plenty of academic stuff in journals the problem is how do we engage that with the audience how do we turn these invisible things into the visualizable because we without being visualizable they are not activatable and without act not activatable, then they're not democratically changeable. You know, we will not turn out and vote for these things and fight for these things uh, if we don't care about them. If 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 a glacier was disappearing over the course of an uh, of an afternoon, uh, everybody would be demonstrating against it. It's that it's that frog in the boiling water. You know, you put him and you just heat up the water generally, and the frog just sits there and dies. You throw him in the boiling water, he leaves tray out again. And a lot of the problem with a lot of these processes, what Kadir does and what I do, is they're just not fast enough for us to care about them. Uh, and it takes a great photographer like Kadir to, to turn it into something which is, is engaging and seductive and draws you in and then activates you. Absolutely. And there are lessons there for journalists too, in that we're stuck on a daily time. It's all about time scales, isn't it? And expressing, finding ways to express the really important time scales, which, which are slower. Uh, and news journalism is still stuck on a daily nine time scale. The finance, industry is stuck on a quarterly time scale and politics is stuck on a four-year or five-year electoral time scale so we we're screwed by our inability to kind of think beyond that and uh, i think art and the kind of work that you're both doing um does enable us to see uh, across time in a way and that's that's hugely hugely uh, uh necessary now we, ha we all have to be more creative to to, to improve understanding of what's happening um, I think that's, a, that's a great thing to take to an audience of something like Belfast Photo Festival, you know, lots of photographers, photo students and the rest of it is, you know, here you go, this is me and Kadir and you, and we're putting down this challenge, right? You're the, you're the generation that's going to suffer from this, students coming out of photography colleges now, you're going to deal with the consequences of climate change, I'm not going to deal with it, I'm going to be far away, right? I'm going to be you know, pushing up daisies. Uh, find a way to make these issues urgent and important and timely and demanding of those people that can politically act on these things. Yeah. I think that's a great thing to put down in front of students. You know, you can make great work, but if it's all la da theory and great chunks of Roland Barthes and, and Marcuse and Walter Benjamin, uh, nobody's gonna engage with that, right? Find a way to engage. That's my challenge, that's John's challenge, that's Kadir's challenge to you watching this lecture. I'll discuss it further with Kadir later today. Yeah, let's fingers crossed. Um, uh, in the meantime, I'll let you finish off your packing uh, and I wish you a safe journey and hope our paths can cross again. Thanks Thank very you. much for joining us, Simon. You're very welcome. Thanks very much, John. Thanks. Thanks, Michael, for arranging everything too. Ah, well, uh, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did this morning. And in fact, I even enjoyed it second time around. Some really brilliant ideas there. Um, Kadir, um, you, you, you are described as the last of the Mohicans uh, for, for your uh, uh, dedication to documentary truth and your ability to sell these kinds of stories. Um, and you probably also heard that, that very passionate challenge, uh, perhaps not to our generation, but to the next generation. Well, it should be to every generation, I think, about how to overcome the challenge of t time scales and, and, and find a way to make these slow burning issues urgent and engage with people. Um, we will have one question. We, well, we've got a couple of questions to deal with. So, but just very briefly, uh, a, a chance to respond 
to what Simon said because we're already well over our hour. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, just... I, uh, you know, I, I guess it was the best uh, presentation I saw of a photographer is uh, to s show not an image uh, which he made. But uh, I've seen the work and it's great work. And, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, as I mean, I, I admire him for his dedication. And I think we, we are the same generation and, and we share this that, that you know, I mean, you, you can only do this work if you believe in it. You can only do this work because you, you're convinced that this is a story to be told. And then it's your own professionalism or creative, uh, the, your creativity which which will create the momentum but that's you know i mean that's why i probably never was a star photographer because I, you know I, I would be shit you know i'm very bad in assignments it's it doesn't work for me if somebody tells me what to do i mean i need my heart needs to be there and i need to be connected yeah I, I mean i got connected to this story probably because of my dutch roots i got connected because as a kid uh, at, at primary school, you had to slice up a, a dike on paper and had to tell what layers it's been built of. So but I think it's, it's very much needed, you know? I mean, I think it's uh, in-depth uh, investigative journalism is not what it used to be. And I think the Trump era and everything that we see around us is, makes it more and more, uh, more important. So. Thank you, Simon. You know, I mean, uh, it's very inspiring, even for me. You know, I mean, I I need people. I've tried to surround my myself with people like Simon and people who are dedicated and 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 believe that uh, that the story needs to be told. Uh, I I completely agree. I mean, for me, I I've been really uh, inspired by the two of you. I think the combination of sort of artistic technique and artistic history that Simon emphasized and uh, photojournalism and, and dedication to the reality of what's happening beyond what news editors tell us is the agenda. Uh, that, those two things uh, are, are really essential to addressing this, the climate crisis and other environmental problems we had. I'd like, to, we, I'd like to finish off Kadir, with, with two questions that we have. I'll put them together. I'll just tell you the two questions together because uh, they're related. And I think they would also give you a, a, good, a good way to sort of end on a sort of a positive or at least uh, a, a forward looking uh, ending. So the, the two questions, one is by Jonathan Ryder, who says, Kadir, your work is just breathtaking. You bring, you bring these issues to life very vividly, and I think that's important because it can help to shake us out of the numbness that so many negative news stories can in, induce. So he says, can I ask, how hard is it to get the interest of news agencies and other news outlets? You talked about the uh, New York Times being interested. Did they take much persuasion? So that's one question. The second question from... Uh, F. Carruthers, uh, who says, images and talks are moving and stories come across loud and clear. What will it take to move our politicians from their willful slumber? So I'll, I'll sort of wrap that up. It's, it's really, I suppose, how do, you, how do you get people interested who are used to the old way of doing things, who most newspapers emerged in the fossil fuel industry? Uh, in the fossil fossil fuel era, um, and, and we're trying to move to something different. So politicians and newspaper editors, they're not really, they don't have the background to think of these new challenges. What have you found that makes people take note? What moves people? And and I'll, I'll leave it there as as the your final comments. Not easy. I'm sort of asking you to inspire the troops and send them um, to battle. You know, I mean, as as I said, you know, I mean, it it all comes with, because I'm convinced of 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 what I do and that I feel that it's important. But that there's been always in my career, but also in this story I just showed you, there are numerous times that I think I'm fucking it up. You know, I mean, the picture is lousy. You know, I'm not. I traveled uh, half the world for, to get there, and it's not there. And I'm and and 
So, you know, and you keep on trying, you keep on trying. And, and what's been very important for me for over the last 10 years, it's not just photography anymore. So, you know, I, I think it's important that you think how, how you want to reach an audience. And I grew up, you know, I grew up in film. I was a black and white film shooter. You know, I was my, so my, my audience was my audience from newspapers and magazines. Your audience is much wider now, you know? I mean, I think it's, it's incredible what you can do actually. And it's not about the money in the end, right? I mean, of, of course we all have to make a living, but you know, I mean, the, the, and it pay, pays off, right? I mean, to, to dedicate so much time, what either Simon does or, or what I do, uh, it, it might seem to be completely stupid to do so, but, but it, it pays off because, you know, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I, I have knowledge. And that's the, you know, I mean, that's probably how it went with the New York Times. I can give you a very brief, it was very funny, <laughs> how it went with the New York Times because I was in New York. I used to live in New York for, for a few years. I was supposed to, I had an appointment with the director of photography at Time Magazine to pitch the project on the rising sea level, which was at the very early stage. And uh, I just, I know one of the editors of the New York Times and he said, come by for a coffee. And, uh, and, um, and I uh, said, yeah, let's have a coffee. And he said, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm starting this project on the rising sea level. He said, that sounds really interesting. And he said, uh, I want that. And I'm like, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you you know, right? Editors they sometimes say, uh, but then it's it's bluffing. So uh, I said, but I have an appointment at time, and he said, cancel the appointment. And I said, excuse me, and uh, and uh, I said, but you know, he was a photo editor, and so I said, well, I don't know what to do, man. And he said, well, I'm I'm going up, uh, have another coffee, and I'll call you in half an hour. Called me in half an hour, and he said, can you come up? And I said, uh, sure. So I came up and he, uh, he said, uh, okay, uh, we have to go to the conference room. I walk into this conference room and he said, uh, where's your laptop? You connect it to the projector and you have to present your project. And that was like the environmental editor. There was the whole photo desk. There was the economic editor. There were like 15 people in the room. I was not prepared. But with the research I did so far and the few images uh, I had, I convinced them that this was an important story to be told. And they said, uh, you're up. So I never expected that. I never expected a, a newspaper like the New York Times to embark on something like that. But that it was a, a very good lesson for me that, that you know, if, if you do your research properly and you know what you're talking about, uh, you'll get there. Thank you so much, Kadir. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you won't be the last of the Mohicans. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm absolutely certain that more and more people will be taking on this subject, uh, and eventually, half of newspapers will be talking about this subject one way or another. Uh, so I hope that the people are listening are inspired, as I've been, by what you've told us about um, journalistic practice. Uh, and about what Simon told us about a, a sort of more artistic, creative uh, way of looking at the subject and, and can combine them to create that sense of urgency and that ability to move that, that we've heard about uh, quite a bit today. So uh, thank you very much to the Belfast Photo Festival for having us. Thank you all for joining us. Um, have a very good evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you.